author, columnist, managing editor of LibertyNation.com, podcast host and conservative policy advocate. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Welcome to Liberty Nation Radio here on the Radio American Network. There's another war in Israel and the death toll has reached the thousands. On today's special edition, we'll be examining every facet of the ongoing conflict. We're fortunate to have with us a voice who can hopefully bring some much needed clarity on the situation in Israel. And now this is a retired Air Force pilot and former Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Controller, I think I've got that right, uh, who also happens to be Liberty Nation's National Security Correspondent, Mr. Dave Patterson. Mark, great to be with you. Good to have you on again. Now, Dave, um, it's a uh, as you know this this whole show we're going to be talking about the Israel situation. Now, uh, Israel has been involved in a a host of military engagements since 1948. Now, some of those are short lasting, like the the Six Day War um, and the Yom Kippur War of '73, which you and I were talking about just before we started recording, which I think was about 20 days. Uh, and there were others that really drew out and just became part of the daily life for the Israeli people, like the the, the, the South Lebanon conflict, which I, I think that was maybe 15 or 16 years. Now, this most recent thing with, with Hamas that, that's taking place right now, do you, do you feel this is something that's going to be uh, short-lived or long-term or, or has a, a Rubicon being crossed and we're now in a whole new arena of conflict different to any others? I think that uh, it's probably going to be a much different conflict than uh, Israel has experienced, nor has the uh, United States and its support for Israel experienced. Uh, the 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 magnitude and the uh, violence and, and the uh, just simply horrific uh, behavior on the part of uh, the murderous terrorists that came across Gaza is. Uh, it's been significant, and I think that uh, as uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said uh, very eloquently, uh, there will be a price to pay, and it will be more than they have ever experienced before. However long that takes is uh, the is going to be determined by how uh, how violent Israel comes into uh, the Gaza. Okay, so you've had obviously um, within Gaza, there's the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, that they say that they're in contact with uh, world leaders to stop the the progression of war. Uh, and I, firstly, I think my, my question has to be: Are the PLO even relevant anymore? Are, are they even part of the equation that's taking place between uh, Israel and Hamas? Because Israel's intention now is to to destroy every specter of Hamas, right? Uh, and so, is are the PLO are they genuine actors in this now? Are they actually seeking peace, or I don't know? It's a strange situation because they they haven't really been relevant for quite a while. Now they're they're, they're piping up talking about peace, but is is their version of peace really? Israel just accept what's happened at the hands of Hamas and let's call it a day. Is, is that what they're after? I think that's that's probably closest to the truth. I know Abu Abbas, the uh, the leader of the Palestinian Authority, has not been particularly effective. And uh, like his predecessor, uh, he, as one person put it, uh, he never loses an opportunity to lose an opportunity. Mm. And... Uh, so I don't think that the Palestine, the Palestinian Authority is of any particular significance. Um, their their relevance may come more to the fore when uh, Israel decides what to do with uh, the Gaza Strip. But right now, uh, I don't see the Palestine Authority, Palestinian Authority, as being particularly relevant. So you, you say it will come to the fore when uh, Israel decides what to do. With Gaza, and, and that's really the situation now, isn't it? It's it seems that Netanyahu, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, he's he's ready to go further in his retaliation, as he said he would. Uh, but could this be the end of, like, for example, I, I'm not really sure how to phrase this, but what we've seen over the last seventy-five years, 
it could all that now be over within the next year because of the actions of Hamas and the retaliation of Israel. So could it be a situation where these things can never happen again because the situation no longer exists? I think that there's that possibility. I think there's also the possibility that uh, what Israel does uh, will create a uh, a, a, a true uh, alignment of some of the uh, Arab nations that already dislike uh, Israel, and and that will start to uh, make life a little bit more difficult. But as we have seen in the past, after past uh, conflicts, uh, 1967, Yom Kippur in 1973, and most more recently, uh, the 2014 Hamas attacks. Uh, yeah, there will be a, a, a sense of tension in, in the Middle East. But at the same time, I think there is a uh, growing understanding that in order for everyone to exist in a way that is beneficial, that they're going to have to make some accommodation on both sides. And uh, I thought that uh, there was great opportunity uh, during uh, Saudi Arabia, particularly uh, having an agreement with uh, Israel and joining the uh, Abram Accords, uh, as did UAE. Uh, and there was hope there. And uh, one would think that uh, that's possible again, but not right away. But I do think there's going to be a a new uh, alignment. I'm not confident as to how that will look, but uh, I think that Israel is going to, and rightly so, uh, do what it has to do to make sure that Hamas is not a an organization anymore. That there, it is simply wiped from the face of the earth. And for those in the immediate vicinity, that will be a good thing. And so how do you see the future of the West Bank in particular, Dave? I think the future will be uh, calm if the uh, Palestinians in the West Bank do not join with the uh, Hamas uh, initiative here. And we're starting to see Hamas called for uh, riots and, and for the uh, Palestinians in the West Bank to rise up whether or not they do and to what extent they do, I think will actually determine their future. Yeah, there was actually uh, a call from the former Hamas chief, uh, Khaled, Khaled Mashal. Uh, and he said, this was on Wednesday, and he, he said uh, that all of those neighbors should rise up uh and i, I think he says i'm like uh, to all the scholars uh, who teach jihad this is the moment for application uh and i wonder if that was aimed at the the civilians in the west bank who who really just want to go on with their lives and keep their their families safe and i think it was aimed at at them and i mean he does he still have a lot of sway do you think do you think that kind of call to jihad ha has an appeal I, I don't think it does to so many people who who want to live you know essentially i i think you're right about that i think that there is a a, a greater uh incentive for uh the arabs and arab israelis israeli arabs who who live and work and 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 have to live day to day in the west bank as well as in israel uh, that their motivation to exist will probably outweigh this foolish jihadist call to action. Let's hope so. Uh, Dave Patterson, we'll be back with you after this short break. Don't go anywhere. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. And we're back with Liberty Nation's national security correspondent, Mr. Dave Patterson. Now, Dave, uh, I want to move on to the the u.s reaction and also ideas a little further field on the israel issue here now after president biden made his speech on tuesday he, he was warning the uh, the enemies of israel who might be tempted to get involved he said uh, quite emphatically don't don't he said it twice so you know that he meant it right um oh, yeah. but within hours of that we had uh, hezbollah sending missiles into northern israel from 
the Lebanon. Now, he, he drew a line in the sand and it was ignored completely. Uh, and this seems to me, this, this seems to me a very Obama-esque position, isn't it? Where lines are drawn, they're overstepped, then they're redrawn. Now, and I suppose I would also like to know, do you see what uh, Hezbollah's doing in Lebanon? Is this just an opportunistic engagement or, or is something else afoot there? No, I think that it's, uh, it, it is opportunistic, absolutely. Mm. But at the same time, the, the, uh, the enterprise that everybody's dancing around and that the Biden administration will not bring into the conversation is Iran. Mm. And Hezbollah and Hamas are both puppets of Iran, and anybody who thinks that they aren't is just as naive as... As Anthony Blinken. Yes, Anthony Blinken, thank you. Uh, you. You don't like to do ad hominem attacks, but nonetheless... No, this is this is truly ridiculous not to absolutely to out Iran as one of the significant problems in the Middle East. Uh, at Liberty Nation, we have written about this on several occasions. But, you know, you start to connect the dots here and you start to see that in the middle of all of it is Iran. People will talk about, well, you know, there's no exact, uh, accurate or precise information about Iran. Well, let's get real here. I mean, how precise do you need to be mm -hmm. when Iran has provided all of the Katusha rockets, has provided all of the money that goes to to backstop Hezbollah and Hamas? And, and, and by the way, so does uh, so does uh, Russia, as a matter of fact. And you start to look at what exactly took place prior. And although correlation obviously is not causation, but when you have representatives from Iran going to uh, Moscow to chat about how they're going to provide support for Russia's unwarranted and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, and you don't think that somebody's going to mention in August that there is a operation afoot to invade Israel, that's just, that's very naive. We wouldn't do that if we were talking with an ally about an operation we had in mind that might disrupt something they were having on ongoing. Of course, we would say, talk to them about it. And so to suggest that Iran didn't talk to Russia, at least to give them a heads up, I think is very naive. And uh, it, you know, and it goes back to the Middle East, where if Syria gets a cold, Hamas sneezes. Mm. There is no way to disconnect all of these players from what goes on contemporaneously with their uh, equities and with their agendas. It's um, it's funny how, and I, I I don't like to use this word so much, but. Uh, Mr. Blinken, he, he seemed almost desperate to poo-poo the idea that Iran was involved. Now, I understand operational security, and you, you don't want to be making claims that uh, can later be proven false, because that's, that'll hurt you both politically and on national security level. But he was so keen to dismiss the idea that um, Iran had any involvement, uh, or that they had no evidence of involvement, but still keen to to point out the fact that the six billion dollars that had been released uh, for Iran's use hadn't been touched yet and was only earmarked for food and health provisions and would be overseen on that release. And it's almost as though it felt to me, and this is why I I uh, I would like to go a little bit harder on Mr. Blinken uh, under these circumstances. It seemed to me as though he was trying to pull a fast one because the idea that if you give me $6 billion here and say, Mark, you can only spend this on food and we're going to watch. And I go, okay, that's no problem. But I've got another $6 billion in my other hand. And I was going to spend that on food myself. But this $6 billion I have to spend on food. So now I've got $6 billion on this hand that I was going to spend on food. But I don't have to because I've got $6 billion in my other hand. Now I can spend that money, that $6 billion that I've already got myself, on something entirely different. And if that happens to be sponsoring terrorism across the Middle East, well then, 
the, the idea that an extra six billion in hand to pay for all the food that I've got to pay for anyway, all the health provisions that I have to pay for anyway, didn't free up some cash for terrorist activities. Well, that's just ridiculous, isn't it, Dave? Absolutely ridiculous. And to, for them to suggest that the American people who listen to them aren't savvy enough to figure this out mm. for themselves. I mean, how how dumb do they think that the American people are or the rest of the world yeah. for that matter? It's it's ridiculous. And 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 if in fact what everything they said was true, there is a psychological motivation, a psychological presence and gravitas that says to the Iranians We've got them. Look, we can ask for anything and they'll do it. And so we're going to go do what we want to do because the feckless Biden administration isn't going to do anything. In fact, they're going to support our case to the rest of the world. So why should we pay any attention to them? And and so you, you look at whether they have the money or not, it is... A, a support for Iran that you certainly didn't see in the Trump administration. And for that matter, in Bush or Reagan, you didn't see this kind of foolishness. Mm. And they didn't have that many wars in the Middle East. Yeah, it, it, uh, it, it seems to me that Joe Biden, President Biden, he, he wants the Iran deal to go ahead because obviously it was it was crafted by the obama administration the the wise hearts in the obama administration uh, and then donald trump came along and said we're not doing it uh and so joe biden wants to get back to that because he wants to erase any uh any and all legacy that donald trump may have and that includes let's be fair the abraham accords which are possibly the only thing saving those who are, are trying to escape from the region right now but but even after all this, do you think that Joe Biden will still be pushing for the Iran deal to go forward? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that though the subject was different, mm -hmm. the, 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 the almost uh, fanatical adherence to ideas that they have come up with, it was adequately portrayed by John Kirby when he said, oh, yes, you know, <laughs> climate change is a uh, a threat. We need to be co concerned because it could wipe out the entire world. I'm sorry. Nobody believes that. Hmm. And yet they adhere to this l ludicrous notion continually. They also adhere as kind of an analog to this idea that they can get Iran to give up their nuclear uh, ambitions, they're not going to. And the only thing that they'll understand is when you present them with such an agonizing alternative that they have to give it up. And, and it, the United States has not done that under, uh, not even come close under Biden. And seems they, un and seems I unlikely to. We'll be back with Dave Patterson after this short break. Don't go anywhere. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. And we're back talking Israel with Liberty Nation's national security correspondent, Mr. Dave Patterson. Now, earlier in the show, we were talking about the Iran deal and the Biden administration's attitude towards it. Now, Dave, I, I want to get your take on this. What is the underlying what are the underlying principles of the Biden administration, specifically with regards to foreign policy, I guess? I think that if you, you look at what they do and what they say, you cannot help but come to the conclusion that they address the world as though it were the wish they wished it were, not the way it really is. They have a totally unrealistic view of global politics, of geopolitical politics, of international relationships. They cannot come to grips with the fact that there is a reality and they're not addressing it, but rather they're looking at it as though they, the world were the way they wished it were. You look, look at 
for example, the the Iran nuclear deal. The Iran nuclear deal was ridiculous. They had two weeks to prepare for any sort of an inspection. And, you know, you have a, a pop-up surprise inspection and you give them 24 hours is too much. And to 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 say, oh, yes, we we really think that this is a good deal. Not only that, but look at the way in which they they negotiated everything if we're really nice to you first will you be nice to us that is an absurd approach to your children let alone to it, uh, in their national was, relationships what, was it was absurd. it churchill's uh, thoughts on appeasement appeasement is uh, feeding the alligator in the hopes that it will eat you last was that churchill That's right. <laughs> exactly but Dave, some, something that's been uh, in the back of my mind since the, well, since the attacks began, um, and specifically with relation to how well coordinated everything was, you had aerial land and water assault all at the same time as a major cyber attack, a denial of service attack, DDoS attacks, they call it, uh, to sow further confusion. Now, if I were the mastermind of this whole thing, the events of last weekend would have been my opening gambit, not the end. The, the, and there's further, and I hate to use this, this word, but there's further game to be played out, it seems to me. And if the leadership in Washington, D.C. think that they're presently dealing with just the aftermath of something rather than uh, merely the end of the beginning, then I, I suspect we're in for... A, a lot more bloodshed before it's all over. Does that does that make any sense? Yeah, I think it does, and I think that one of the things that 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 uh, is a natural uh, result of what you're saying is that you take, for example, you know, always you look at you know who benefits, qui bono, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, who benefits here? Well, Iran benefits clearly because now they have uh, stirred up a uh, a lot of turmoil. And they'll be able to do things behind the curtain that uh, they would not have been able to do otherwise. Russia also benefits because now the United States is focused on the Israeli uh, problem and, and supporting as best they can Israel. And, uh, and, and so I think that you are right, and this is going to be a somewhat pro more protracted than I obviously than than uh, than Biden or France or Germany or anybody else would like to have it because it takes away from their focus on on Ukraine. But nonetheless, I think that's what's going to happen. And you also have this other aspect, and I don't think we should um, dismiss it. And that is what we we find out that the Biden administration has allowed Iranian sympathizers in their administration, mm -hmm. in positions of importance, and there is one working as the chief of staff in special operations, low intensity conflict in the Pentagon. This is, I mean, breathtakingly stupid. It, it is. It's uh, that That's a, a scandal that's still unfolding and I suspect we'll see a lot more more depth to it. But you, you talk about the sympathizers. Uh, there's a, if you, any brief perusal of social media, I think it it, it shows. I, I don't know if this is just in the social media realm, but there, there's very much a, a shifting of a, the whose side are you on, folks? Especially some of the younger generations. We we see we saw in the in the wake of the attacks. Uh, pro-Palestinian rallies all over America, in Europe, in Australia, outside Sydney Opera House, where they, they gathered to, to chant, gas the Jews, uh, of all things. And it, it seems that there's this changing attitude where we can't say, you know, uh, you, you're in the wrong on this. Hamas is wrong. There, there, there is no justification for the kind of slaughter they engaged in.
Um, and then, but of course, what we found is that our neighbors and our countrymen are outside the Israeli embassies here in, in the UK, waving Palestinian flags and cheering the deaths of Israelis. Uh, chants of gas the Jews in, in Sydney uh, and similar things at the uh, swastikas apparent at the Democratic Socialists of America rally in New York City last week. Um, how do we go back to saying, well, these are our friends and countrymen and we, and we have the, the same shared values that our politicians are always telling us we have shared values. That That's what makes us one. After we've seen them cheering the deaths of innocence. How do we go back from that? Uh, I, I think that you don't you don't go back from it because these people have been there all along. They just haven't, you know, oozed up from the muck and that we don't have shared values with them. So there's it's a pretense. It's 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 a silly idea that there are going to be that there is any way possible whether it's America, Australia, pick your favorite country that that says it's a democratic country and to suggest that there aren't elements within that country about uh, that you cannot share values because they don't and will not. For example, I mean, if take for example, if the rallies had said those kinds of things about the LGBTQ community, mm. they would have been arrested for hate speech in an instant and yet these creatures can say these horrible horrible things and they're just part of the free speech movement and i don't think we can come back from them i think they've identified themselves and good that that they have and we we make them irrelevant in our community yeah it's quite uh Shocking to see some of these groups that have had such support from mainstream, uh, mainstream America, mainstream Europe, Black Lives Matter, for example, coming out with a flag saying Black Lives Matter supports, and they've got pictures of Hamas, te- the images of Hamas terrorists with parachutes, which is how they, they went into the concert to slaughter those people. Uh, and I think a lot of people are going to be hopefully turn their back on organizations black lives matter for example that supports the actual terrorists i mean they're not saying they support palestine here they're saying they've got images of the terrorists as they were paragliding in and they're saying they support that Uh, absolutely but is anybody confused about black lives matter they are absolutely anti i I, I wasn't fooled i mean patrice color says she was a trained marxist from the beginning Yeah. I mean, my goodness, you know, and and the only fools in America were the fools who gave Black Lives Matter money. That's mm. the only those are the only fools in America. And think of all of the uh, the corporations that did that. I think that if if it, this may be on the fringe of recommendations, but I think that if the Biden administration were to uh do something that would identify them as truly interested in the uh, future of Israel, they'd unfreeze the $6 billion and give it to Israel. Interesting take. Dave, we'll be right back with you after this short break. Audience, thanks for listening. Don't go anywhere. Back soon. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. And we're back with Liberty Nation's national security correspondent, Mr. Dave Patterson. Now, early in the show, we've been talking all the facets of the Israel situation. There's just a couple more data points that I'd like to go over, Dave, uh, if I may. The the first one has to be in 1979, uh, Iranian terrorists, they held American hostages. I think it was slightly more than 50 uh, hostages, uh, and they held them for 444 days. Now, that, that was really a a bit of humiliation, I think, for America in general and for President Carter specifically. Now, we know that at the time that we're recording this, Dave, that there are at least 14 U.S. hostages being held amongst the scores of others. Um, Now, do you see, bearing 1979 in mind, do you see there 
release or delayed release being used to further demoralize the U.S. and specifically to embarrass U.S. leadership? I think that uh, actually there were uh, 14 Americans killed uh, during the uh, during the invasion of the murderers, and there may be as many as 20, if not slightly more, uh, Americans being held hostage or uh, Israeli-American dual citizenship being held hostage. But to your point, this, this is the Achilles heel of any government mm. because you were, your citizens are your, are your cherished uh, uh, equity. Mm. And to see them in these kinds of circumstances is extremely difficult for, for governments to, to deal with. Carter found this out and uh, and unwilling to to do really what n was necessary to do. I mean, he had that botched uh, uh, rescue attempt that cost uh, eight, eight servicemen dead yes. in the helicopter. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that that was just ridiculous. I mean, to I mean, the 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 backstory on it is is pathetic in in how it was planned and. What they did at the very last minute and and it it just it's ridiculous but it goes to a point where your citizens are going to demand that you do something and when you look at the alternatives there are very few things that you can actually do yeah uh you can go in and you can capture and hold your own hostages and now you have a quid pro quo in the hostage negotiations. Uh, but in this case, I think that what's going to happen is that the, the United States, working very closely with, uh, with the IDF, is going to work to fix this problem one way or the other and, uh, and to make an attempt to, to get the hostages back I trust that they'll be uh, clever and creative enough to be successful. Uh, if history is any indicator, it's going to be very difficult because Israel is uh, determined to ensure that Hamas no longer exists hmm. in this world, and rightly so. Yeah, I, I think uh, that... that nobody is is going to be willing to to let this drag on for the the 444 days that oh. it happened i mean that was it was an error on jimmy carter's part to to let that carry on uh but you know hindsight is always 2020 now uh, something I, I always want to get into dave is we talk a lot about the international response to things nowadays whenever we're dealing with global affairs uh, our governments tend to talk about what the international response is, what the global response. Uh, and in, in my mind, I always hear the word, the globalist response, the globalist response. Um, and we've had uh, this kind of, we've had responses. And I, I want to go through a couple with you and get your take on them. So first off, the, there's NATO. Now, NATO has been a very united front when it comes to Ukraine. But with Israel, we have a, a Turkish minister, I believe it's the Minister of Education, um, now, Turkey is obviously a member of NATO, saying that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu will one day be shot and die uh, for what he's engaging in now. And now, how, how do we really square the circle that NATO can have any useful involvement in the situation when NATO members are essentially backing Hamas? I think that that's a real problem for NATO. It's a problem for any uh, globalist organization uh, where uh, uh, the goods of the the good of the few is also the good of the many, mm. and uh, they have a problem. Uh, no one has been uh, willing to uh, to put the uh, Erdogan government on notice within NATO. Uh, nobody has been willing to do anything economically in terms of sanctions toward Turkey uh, because of its NATO uh, uh, membership. 
But since Erdogan has become the, uh, the, the leader of Turkey, Turkey has basically issued uh, all of the, the, the values, uh, except when it's in their interest, of, of NATO. And I think that people need to start to, to, to counsel uh, Turkey on its uh, on its behavior. On the other hand, you you have to come to a conclusion at some point that the the people who gather at Davos and Aspen uh, uh, don't have the people of the United States interests at heart. They have some notion of uh, a, a globalist hegemony hegemony and. Uh, it, it, it is not consistent with uh, the uh, populism within the United States, nor is it consistent with uh, the way the United States sees itself, not the Biden administration, but uh, the uh, those who have a, a, a good view of the, uh, the way that the United States has conducted itself over its history in terms of the rest of the world. And it... it with some few exceptions, I believe that uh, the United States has been a an overall uh, power for good in, in in the world, and it's been an exceptional nation. And that exceptionalism has not had anything to do with elite thinkers in Davos. True enough. It's sometimes strange bedfellows need to get separate hotel rooms. Uh, I think, Dave. Now, um, America, she's committed to supplying and supporting two wars now, two major conflicts on foreign soil. Um, and I get the arguments. It, it bolsters national security to have wars fought overseas rather than on y- your home turf. But I, I do wonder how much the American public, um, and in fact, let's be fair, most of the Western world can really take economically, spiritually, and, and emotionally. How much more of this fighting on two fronts can the West take, Dave? Well, I think that you you, you make a very good point, uh, Mark. I think that there is going to be a significant stress uh, emotionally, economically, and and from a leadership perspective as well. And that, that, that stress could be mitigated uh, somewhat if the United States had a leadership uh, uh, in which the American people could uh, could count, could have confidence. But everything that takes place from a perspective of U.S. leadership has to be seen through mm. the lens of the debacle of the Afghanistan withdrawal. And people can say, yes, but that was back in 2021. I'm sorry, everybody. Th- that's how they think of this administration and this national security team. And so there has to be leadership will will sustain a lot of pain. It, it, it certainly did during World War II, but this dearth of leadership that the United States has now is just simply going to make the economic pain seem more intense. And if if Biden wanted to uh, uh, free up some money, he could certainly get rid of this climate change crap and. Uh, and all the money that's being spent in trying to get people to, to, to do things to accommodate a fiction of climate change. Uh, advice from Dave Patson, hopefully straight to the ears of President Joe Biden. Dave Patson, thank you ever so much for being with us today. Thank you, Mark. Always good to be with you. And that's all we have time for on this week's special edition of Liberty Nation Radio right here on the Radio America Network. My thanks to Dave Patterson for his insight and thoughts and to you at home for joining us. Let's all hope that peace awaits us in the very near future. Thanks for listening. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Don't get caught up in the media madness. Join our movement for free thinking and free speech at LibertyNation.com. Publishing news and analysis 24-7 with original articles by our team of authors who tell it like it is. Join us each week for online TV shows, The Uprising Podcast, and Liberty Nation Radio. We believe in free thinking 
and free speech. We are LibertyNation.com.